You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. Hey, all right, guys. Welcome to another episode. It is Sunday Sermon, 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 or Sermon Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. And we are finishing up the very last part of the first section of Chapter 4 in Ephesians. And I don't really have much of an intro, so we're just going to sort of just get into it here in a moment. So just check out Facebook, leave a review, share, like, send disagreements, whatever. It's all good. Um, I will interact with that. Um, Check out the YouTube videos. There's two out now on biblical interpretation. I will continue to do those and release them on a weekly basis basis i'm planning on a weekly basis i may not want to make that promise though we'll just see so like i said we're finishing up this first section in chapter four so this is uh chapter 4 14 15 and 16 and i go to into a little bit of a rant at the beginning and i left it in there so you guys could hear it because it all i guess it kind of ties in i don't know what i was doing really uh really hyped up this morning on a lot of my coffee was just too strong not much in the coffee anymore these days um one or two cups is good is fine for me in the morning that's it um don't don't like it too strong either so anyway been a little antsy a little 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 jittery if you will so i was a little all over the place took me a while to get my composure but i got it and i got the point across so i hope it speaks well to you guys so here it is so let's review let's see we will today we'll be in 14 15 and 16 We'll be ending this little section here. I don't know if I can be able to go faster after this or not. I guess I'll just let you know next week after I study this week. (laughs) Um, All right, so the review then would be that building on the gift of grace and gifts that have been given to men, Paul has established this emphasis, all right, and the emphasis of the gift of ministry that we went through last week um, with the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, which I said maybe, hopefully I wouldn't be overreaching, but put brackets in that, and the, the emphasis is actually the church has been given the gift of ministration, and but those gifted with the grace of of preaching and teaching were to mend that which was broken, but now a holy thing, you guys, the saints, to be servants and to live in service to the Lord by the good works in which we have all been created for in Christ. So this is the outcome of in, I believe in this context, the outcome of biblical doctrine that transforms and renews the minds of us, the saints, the followers of Christ, those who have been placed in Christ. All right. So now Paul is going to give some vital signs of a healthy body, and it's by no means comprehensive, but they seem to be at the core of his point here, and, here, and, and we'll, we will see doctrinal discernment in verse 14 we will see practicing truth in love in verse 15 and then also they are growing in Christ's likeness by submitting to Christ's lordship and then in verse 16 that all members contribute to the growth okay 
So let's just jump in there. So like I said, we're in the middle <laughs> of a sentence there. But it's a real long sentence, right? So the previous, though, he said, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. I would believe, tacking on to last week, that knowledge of the Son of God, if we, if we say we do not have the knowledge of the Son of God, which is, would be the gospel and all that's contained here within the Bible, um, th- what are we doing, right? What are we doing? So that is possible. We do have this knowledge here. In this, that unity of the faith is doctrinal. So he goes on to say then, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, so this is where we're at. 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. So doctrinal em- emphasis there. By human cunning by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Okay. He always puts so much in these sentences. <laughs> so much. Uh, okay, so <laughs> my mind just went totally somewhere else reading that off of the off of my notes. You know, I don't know how many of you guys hear it. I've heard it a lot though. Christ is coming back for a bride without spot or blemish, right? Which it, it says that, but in the Bible. The fact of the matter is, we are the bride of Christ. We are in the new covenant because he's established that. The marriage has happened. We are clean. We are cleansed by his blood. Therefore, there is no spot or blemish on the bride because we're in Christ. There can't be. If there was, we wouldn't be in Christ. We wouldn't be seated in heavenly places, right? So people are always saying this. Church has to repent, all these type of things. And I, I know I'm being sidetracked now, but uh, it's like if people would just understand what the word actually says, we are the bride. The marriage has taken place. When you come to faith and repent, you are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You exchange your filthy, you know, sinful, fleshly vessel robe for a new white robe that now Christ's uh, Christ righteousness is accredited to you. That's how God sees you. So. I was thinking of that because when at that, that this last part grow up in every way it says the whole the whole body it makes the body grow God sees and I think I've seen it God sees the true body there's several denomination denominations several different type of movements or cults or sects and stuff like that but God sees the true body God knows who the true body is he knows the whole body so we can't always think in the scope of universally, well, that is going to include that, 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 and them. We all have to come together in this unified thing, an agreement that will maybe undermine doctrinal status. No, that's not true because we can't sometimes. We cannot be together with somebody who talks about Jesus just being a man. He was just a man or whatever. I saw, I saw a meme, or it's not even a meme, it was a quote this morning by a Lutheran pastor. It said, if Jesus changed, it's already weird, right? If Jesus changed to be lowly and to love people around him, it meant he had to change his mindset and he changed his ways of his life in order to correctly minister and love to people. So that means we can do it too. <laughs> and I was like, that's not what that, it's not what it said <laughs> it's at all. It doesn't say that. It's like, what? Everybody is in this big group on Facebook, Facebook page. And everyone was like, what? What is going on? <laughs> so we're like, no, no, no. He didn't have to change. 
So this Christ likeness is this here, this core, these core doctrine things. All right. And the, the bride then truly is not c- covered with all these spots and blemishes. We're, we're, we're going to have sin. We're going to do things that we shouldn't do. Right. We know that it's sin. It's the flesh. It's the struggle. But we're cleansed. We are forgiven. Past, present, future. That's grace. Mercy comes to the other things we come into. But we repent. We're still cleansed. We're always cleansed. The bride is pure. The bride is white. The bride of Jesus is in union with Jesus. Therefore, she is clean because the marriage has already happened. And if not, then a lot of people need to stop with their intimacy talk about relationship with God because they're on the edge of fornicating spiritually. (laughs) So that's my my thought there. Okay, so let me move to the text. (laughs) Okay, so Paul is not explicitly stating this biblical doctrine um, uh, of like the required. He's not stating... Sorry, I'm sorry, my, my brain. I had a lot of coffee this morning. While Paul isn't explicitly stating biblical doctrine uh, or the requirement of it, is propped up this entire section within its context, okay? Because he, he talks about bad doctrine here in a minute. So, But we start off with this phrase, so that, and it's the middle of a sentence, like I said. So from the prior verses, it is, that's the connection, that we saw in verse 13, that a mature church grows in this doctrinal unity. Uh, and that would be on this, the core essentials of the faith that we grow in knowledge and then deeper knowledge, all of which continues to re- reveal Christ to us more and more. Okay, So by the, the teaching of sound doctrine, by exposing the word of God, to the saints, then the church is going to be mature so not to be deceived by false doctrines in order to grow up into Christ, the head of the body. All right. And we talked, seen this picture already that Paul has painted of this, the spiritual body of Jesus. This is us. That's what we consist of. So Paul, Paul talks of the spiritual maturity and it's, is, is growing Growing in doctrinal discernment and stability. And his point is the importance of this. It seems to be first and foremost to him. All right. Especially if you knew more about the church in Ephesus. um, There was a temple. Another temple. Uh, Was it Diane? Temple of Diane? Is that? I think that was it. I may not be right. Temple of Diane, all right? Women were in charge there. Um, So you have this huge, besides Gnosticism and Judaizers, you have this temple, this goddess of fertility, this huge temple where these women were in charge and all that, and uh, temple prostitution and sexual acts were being taken place there. So there's tons of opposition all around, all right? So make, make no mistake that, like, It's not anything new to be in here right now and see that there's all this crazy stuff outside the walls. Same, same in first century, even crazier. Okay, (laughs) even crazier. So he's driving home this point of this doctrinal unity, the importance of it to grow in this maturity. Okay, so uh, you take this. Compare it to today's culture in Christianity who seems to dismiss doctrine a lot. All right. There are, there are groups. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> Calvinist really big on doctrine. Systematic theology. It's thorough. It's not all right, but big on it. Uh, Lutherans too. Presbyterians. Big on doctrine. Big on teaching the Bible. Uh, get away from other get away from those camps and you start to uh, may, may not hear the, the importance of doctrine so much. All right. If so, it's usually the, the doctrine of their denomination instead of the doctrine of the Bible, which they've derived though from the Bible, but then they've maybe moved around a little bit to make it fit their manual. You know what I mean? So, 
people today dismiss doctrine and theology. So it's it's also been invaded with postmodernism. And in that worldview, uh, you cannot tolerate somebody who claims to have an exclusive truth because it's all subjective today. Um, it has to be subjective. It cares nothing of the objective type of truth. This here in the Bible, what we're going through is objective. Paul says we are no longer to be children. I think we see a lot of childish things happening today. This last week was probably a great example. As always, whatever's going on in Washington is a great example of child, childness going on. And I'm not saying who was wrong, who was right. I'm just saying a lot of childish stuff goes on in politics today. We are no longer to be children, but to grow to maturity. So we aren't tossed to and fro by these waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, he says. And it's so interesting. But so he's saying this is false teaching. This is false doctrine. Teaching and doctrine are the same. Okay, they're synonymous. And the New Testament is filled with warnings about false teachers, false prophets, and exhortations to believe the truth that's been revealed by God in his word, all right, standing on it, holding on, and defending that truth at all costs. Jesus, Jesus warned of the false prophets. Um, in Matthew 7, he warned. He said, uh, we would know them by their fruit. You hear a lot of about fruit today. If the fruit in your life will show how you live. But people don't see the different uses of fruit in the Bible. And in that context, when he says, you'll know them by their fruit, you'll know them by their doctrine is what he's saying. You will know them by their teachings. This is how to recognize a false teacher or a false prophet, all right? Um, fruit is linked to teaching in that context. Nobody has ever agreed with me on that point <laughs> at all, but I studied that thoroughly, and it is doctrine. Uh, so Paul is warning of this, all right, saying, do not be children. I have a list here of all these things. Paul warned of false prophets disguised as angels of light and servants of righteousness in 2 Corinthians 11. He warned the, the, the Galatians that if men distort the gospel, even if he were to distort the gospel, uh, that they were to be accursed uh, to the Colossians of the, uh, uh, of the ones who were trying to take them captive through philosophy and empty deception. And he warned the Thessalonians there would be a major apostasy that would happen and would deceive many in the church. And in his letters to Timothy and Titus, there's frequent exhortations to preach sound doctrine along with warnings of those who have turned to false doctrine. And then we have John and Peter and even in the book of Revelation all have strong warnings against the dangers of false teachings and false doctrines. So there was much opposition to the true gospel in the first century and to today as well. It still continues, and the Bible presents the true gospel and the true biblical doctrine for us to grow in, along with the warnings for us to beware of the ever-present danger of being led astray by false presentations of our faith and false presentations of Christ himself, along with many other truths that become distorted. This happens a lot, all the time. I see it. Across the board, Jesus was just a man. Jesus went to hell. <laughs> what well, I don't. Uh, what was another one? Jesus had the enemy inside of him, so he was did have sin inside of him, but he wasn't sinful. But that's why he had to go through the temptation in the wilderness to overcome the enemy, which was inside of him, because. If it was not inside of him, then what's the point of us trying to overcome? Really? It's like, that's heretical. The word does not say that. <laughs> Since Satan comes to him and tempts him. So these waves and these winds of false teaching are prevalent and they're all through the Bible and the warnings of them. 
but they're all through the church today and in the world today. And although they are subtle at times, they are very powerful and they are full of worldly philosophy that undermined biblical truth. And it's probably, besides eschatology, one thing I'm really passionate about because I cannot stand hearing people lie about the God that I adore. And I get a lot of junk about the way I approach it and I talk about it. Because that's the body, man. No, it's not. That's a false gospel. They're saved to a false Jesus. I want to save them and snatch them from the flames because it's their soul that's deceived. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I don't cry very much. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so it's important to me. It should be important to us all. For it to be important to us all, we need to get into the word, know what it says, and know what it teaches in order to hear what is being presented. So even when it is subtle, and it is just a tiny twisting of the truth, you can know what's going on. Because there's a lot of ways people can do it, and they present false narratives. They present it in such clever ways that there is, some are slick, man. Some are slick. And... Uh, but once, once, you are, once you are in here, once you are dedicated to Christ, and you know, you know this is, this is it right here. You dedicate yourself to the apostles' teachings. You dedicate yourself to the word of God. So it becomes, it, it is literally living and active. And you can hear these things when you hear these people present the gospel in a false way. All right, so many, many today profess G, that G, it's Jesus um, but they have, they profess the name of Jesus, but they have no need for sound doctrine. They, they're being carried all over by every wind, every uh, uh, wave, and it warps their view of scripture because it's really not that valid. A lot of people dismiss this. I hear it from the pulpit at times. Yeah, we're, this is 2,000 years old. God's revealing new things. You know, it's like, huh, okay. So it makes them all the more vulnerable to all sorts of errors, all right? So think of children, little guy there. They act impulsively. <laughs> they go by feelings, they go by emotions. Oftentimes they aren't very thoughtful or careful, all right? They lack self-control. They can be deceived very easily. I gotta kind of watch what I say now to him when I'm joking around because he'll still believe me. It'll be like, <laughs> it's easier when he was a little, real little, and like, yeah, like popcorn comes from the ceiling fan. What? You know, they believe it, right? Because <laughs> they don't know. They don't know any better. Okay, so these, these definitions of these words that are being used waves, waves in Greek is to be agitated. Or the agitation of the mind. And it also goes on to say it's an abnormal state of mind. And then wind in Greek is adds on to the agitation by saying it's a violent agitation. But it also, the, the Greek word that it's derived from, the root, means empty doctrines. This wind, right? The wind, he says, empty doctrines. Let's see what... Carried about by empty doctrines of doctrine. That's interesting. It also has to do with the actual rent, wind. It also has to do with breath and spirits. And it means spirits that relates to demons or doctrines of demons versus the Holy Spirit inspired word of God. So Paul doesn't mention a specific teaching here. But like I already said, many Greek philosophies... Um, Judaizers, that temple and all that stuff that was going on, that was the, the, the constant opposition in this time. So Paul paints this picture of being tossed by waves, and waves can be violent, deadly sometimes, right? And also a carrying about by wind or spirits, a picture of a spirit that's carrying people about. The Young's literal translation of the Bible says, 
in the slight of men, in craftiness unto the artifice of leading astray. So that, that's interesting, the slight of man. I, I said very subtle. These teachings can be very subtle. The twisting of scripture can just be so subtle, subtle that you may not recognize it. That's why it's important to know the word. So human cunning, we'll get to that in a minute, that slight. Just remember, well, it's right here. Human cunning. That Greek is trickery and slight, okay? It's where we get our word for cube or die, as in dice. And it's, it's literally a reference to about cheating using the sleight of hand, all right? So you can think of magicians, do, they do that, sleight of hand tricks. But in this time, when Paul is writing this, they play dice. And there would be a sleight of hand at the dice to cheat at this game. So it was defrauding the person they were playing with. They were cheating with this. All right, so then we have craftiness and deceitful schemes. And each one of these words, craftiness, deceitful, and schemes, they all have these, these definitions of, all right, craftiness. Being clever in trickery. So you take the sleight of hand thing. You take the trickery and the slight, and then it's being clever in trickery. They're very good at it. Deceitful, well-crafted trickery. It's all trickery. It also points to, it means a method. It's where we get our word method. And then schemes. It's a mental strain. It's error that leads to error, a departure from God's word. So in all of this here, we have this sleight of hand, this clever trickery that has a method to it that's in error and leads people into more error. All right, so false teachers use trickery. They use deceit. They entice you. This deceitful scheming indicates that there is a deliberate plan and to be deceived by them stems from a lack of doctrinal, biblical discernment. Paul, Paul is saying, don't be easy prey like children are. Don't have that kind of vulnerability to your heart. All right? So grow from a babe to maturity. And this contrast is in the next test. Next text is a mature, healthy body. Rather, speaking the truth in love, right? That's a good phrase. Mike and I were talking about it earlier. In the Greek, it is truthing. Or speaking truth into a person's life or to truth. And the, the definition to to truth or truthing, so literally it means truthing in love, okay? Or to truth in love. And it means it includes a spirit led confrontation where it's vital to tell the truth so others can live in God's truth rather than personal illusion or the trickery or the deceit. And in this day and age, we have to say, point to that word, confrontation. It's not bad. It doesn't always mean bad thing. It's not negative. Confrontation can be good. All right? It shouldn't. Here, it's definitely not bad because it says to do it in love. And love here is agape. All right? We should all know agape love. Unconditional. So this, whole, this text encompasses both these truthful words and an honest lifestyle. But however, I would have to say that honesty and integrity isn't the emphasis here because Paul is emphasizing the need to hold to and proclaim the truth of the gospel, which includes this core truth of faith while living these out so our lives back up our words. So he's saying to hold on firmly to the truth as revealed in Jesus here and by, by him and the other apostles, all right? In love, unconditionally. The, the implication is that there is an absolute truth that we can know. It's not subjective. It's not according to individual preference or experience that, um, that can just be said to be this, that, or the other. 
This means that we can know and also we can judge whether someone holds to the truth or they're walking in error. And that isn't arrogance. It's not intolerance. It's not a lack of love either. Because concern for true doctrine and love for others or one another are not alternatives, but they belong together here. It all connects. It's important to see that, I think. So, speaking the truth in love, and then we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, and to Christ from the whole body, right? From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint. All right, so the whole body uh, joined, held together by every joint. Every joint popped out to me. I thought that was interesting. So every joint, that's what binds the members together together. And what that is here is the word. It's Jesus. Jesus is the word, right? So understand when I'm saying the word, I'm not always just meaning straight, like it encompasses both Jesus and the Bible. <clears throat> so the word, the ministry, and doctrinal unity. So growing in Christ is this lifelong journey for all of us. But to grow in all as aspects into Christ means bringing every area of our lives under Christ's lordship. The, 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 fruit, the fruit of the Spirit uh, contrasted with the deeds of the flesh in Galatians 5, I think is a good place to see what's involved in Christ-like behavior. <laughs> so, you know, if you want to refresh yourself on that, you can. But Paul's mention of Christ as the head is this reference to his lordship and his care uh, for all of us. So that, and that care for all of us is for us to care for one another as well, that Christ does for the church through us. So verse 16 is going back actually to verse 7 when it says, but grace was given to each one of us, right? This is all connected and Paul's emphasizing grace and gifts to use in service to one another, that every part has a function. You all have a purpose, right? And I don't mean like your big dreams and goals. I just mean here within the body of Jesus, every part has a function that every joint is together. It binds us with the word of truth, the gospel of Jesus. And when all work in accordance with their function and, uh, uh, the body grows in love. And then, uh, let's see here, it says, each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Being joined and held together then implies a closeness to one another, right? A closeness to Christ. And Paul emphasized, emphasizes on every joint supplying and each part working properly shows them we should be a functioning, service, a serving body. <laughs> that God saved us to serve him in some capacity, building us up in love. So you still have that pink picture of this holy living temple that's growing, all right? On the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus at the chief cornerstone. And we're building each other up in love. We are all working properly, functioning in that grace, functioning in uh, the gift of whatever it is that he's given us in service of being a parent, being a piano player, being someone who locks the door, whatever, right? Love. Joined together, what? By Jesus, the truth, the gospel. But to grow in that, to know more of this is to know more of Jesus, and to know more of Jesus is to know more of the Father, and brings us more into relationship, not just with him personally, but with one another as we grow together and walk in this truth and walk in a doctrinal unity, a biblical doctrinal unity. And I don't mean a church manual, I mean the Bible, all right? And I'm not putting down the, the manuals, I'm just saying. <laughs> this is first. This is first. Because I've been in places where the manual was on top of the Bible. Let's look at the manual. Let's say, why don't we just look at the Bible?
All right. There's another episode. Any questions, comments, disagreements, send them my way at the Kingdom Project Podcast at gmail.com. And until next time, be a mustard seed, be leaven. Thank you for listening. <laughs>